Thank you, Amanda. Uh, I just want to say thank you for the hospitality. It's been great to come here to the UK for the first time and meet with uh, fellow simulation people. It's always great to see the passion and the energy and uh, things that we bring to simulation and to hear what you're doing. It's, uh, it's been great. Um, this morning, I've got the honor and privilege, privilege of introducing uh, Professor Terry Young. Um, I met Terry so many hours ago um, for that uh, uh, last night in the bar over a pint, which was kind of nice. Um, Terry graduated from the University of Birmingham in the UK in physics and electrical engineering before pursuing a PhD. He worked for GEC and then Marconi from 1985 to 2001, first in designing photonic components for optical communications, then in systems design business development before moving into the medical systems. Uh, he was a professor of healthcare systems at Brunel University in London from 1985-2001 and continues to hold an emeritus chair. His healthcare research focused on the value of technology and on service design, while his teaching interests were in blended learning, assessment methods. He founded the Cumberland Initiative to promote the use of simulation and modeling in service development and set up uh, DITCHAT, I think I got that right, um, for consulting his own business in 2018. Professor Young was recognized uh, with the IE Premium in 1989 for a paper on finite element design and as a top 50 NHS innovator by the Health Service Journal in 2013. He's a fellow of the BCS. Please welcome Dr. Tony Terry Young. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Richard, and uh, <clears throat> I'd like to say thank you to CAE for the invitation to speak this morning, and especially to Mandy for um, doing uh, everything else and getting me here and sorting all the details out. So thanks very, very much indeed. Um, your theme is uh, moving from um, the world of education to the world of uh, integration. And uh, I'm quite new to this, this world, um, but I've had a long-term interest in simulation and modeling, computer-based simulation and modeling in healthcare. And it was through a conference that sort of drew these two worlds together, the computer modeling and the world of simulation and mannequins and other sorts of uh, digital uh, uh, synthetic environments uh, that brought, first brought me in touch uh, with Mandy. And I wanted to think a little bit about, uh, in strategic terms, where your world could go if you wanted to take it that way. And so I've chosen the title uh, on digital twins, prototypes and simulators. What's the future? for service training and delivery. Now, what I'd like to try and uh, uh, think about is what is it that you have this whole industry coming together for? What is it that people are paying for? And basically, I think that there's two things that they're out uh, to do. One of them is to learn something that's new to the individual. If I'm coming for training, I don't know how to do something, I don't know how to do a procedure, or I uh, haven't been uh, sort of updating my skills. So you're, you're going to try and put into me something which is new to me. And uh, that's the sort of the standard uh, training or teaching paradigm, giving something that is new to the individual. But a lot of times simulation and models are used for things that are new to everyone. If you've never done something before, how are you going to do it? Well, you could just set out and try and do it, and you might get killed, you might discover that you go bankrupt, uh, you might injure yourself in a serious way. You don't know what the risks are, and so most of the time, what people do is they try and build some kind of a simulator or a model that says, I don't know what this world is like, but I can perhaps try and, and get a little way down that line by making a simulator. Now, the thing is, you all know more about the top point than I do. Uh, I don't, I'm not, I've not used uh, the sort of simulators that you're involved in. Um, so that world is your territory. You know much more about it than I do, and so I will not try and teach you anything about that because I don't know anything um, about that world. But I think what you may want to, or what I'd like to persuade you is really exciting is this world of new to everybody. How can you use the tools that you've got? How can you use the skills that you've uh, built up? How can you use the centers that you're being paid shed loads of money to develop and, and turn into the future? How can you use that to develop services that are new 
to everyone. And I'd like to persuade you that that's at least as exciting and worthwhile as the stuff you're supposed to be doing. I've always found in life that the things I'm not supposed to be doing are much more interesting than the things I am supposed to be doing. And I, I'm going to try and infect you with that virus this morning. And if you all get fired, I'm really sorry. Um, I'll apologize. I'm quite good at apologizing because I tend to get in a lot of difficult situations. Um, so let's think about the new to one paradigm. If you're uh, in a training world, what you're trying to do is to teach somebody something and somebody knows the answers. Usually it's you. You've, you've got the, the simulator, you've designed the program, you know what it is that person is supposed to be doing. You know what comes next when they get stuck. So there is somebody, there is an eye in the sky for them that says as they're going through this process, there is somebody out there who knows what the answer is each time. And, and that person sort of guides them through the process. Now, one of the things um, I've, I think this is probably the third um, sort of conference in a couple of years that I've been to. And, and I quizzed a lot of people at the first one I went to in Los Angeles, um, IMSH. Don't know if any of you uh, uh, go to those uh, conferences. Part of the SSH um, uh, is, is involved in that. And, and I got sucked into that. And I started to talk to these people. And I, say, yeah, and I said to them, yes, but what's your pedagogy? And they would say, well, we're not actually training people or grading them. We just want to get them to a standard where they've, uh, they're able to do something that they couldn't do before. And, and I'm still not satisfied. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what's going on in this world. But it seems to me that there is a big game to be played in terms of how you go about um, teaching. And one of the things... Um, that I, I got into when I, was, um, when, I, when I was at Brunel as a professor was this whole idea about pedagogy. I didn't go into the educational world until I was in my early 40s, and so I had to learn everything from scratch. I, I knew about giving talks and stuff because that's part of my industrial heritage, selling stuff I enjoy. But uh, two of the great revelations to me were, first of all, learning outcomes, which I really came to love. I think they're done badly by almost everybody who does them, but I think there's something really powerful about them if you use learning outcomes in the right way. And the second thing I got into and really enjoyed was assessment frameworks, how you set up uh, particularly threshold-based um, systems where you move from one threshold uh, to another. And uh, one of the things that we did with the final year module um, in the computer science department was to uh, put together a very, very simple pedagogical model that says, first of all, there's some online stuff, there's some book learning, some stuff where you just have to learn by rote, you just have to know the material. Uh, you got to get that under your belt before you can do something else. And then that was followed by a set of interactive sessions where we started to say, well, how do we turn this into something meaningful in the real world? And then following that, uh, we did something on uh, stretching assessments. So open-ended assessments where the students had to go and find out lots and lots of stuff. What's, what studies are there that look like this? How many people does it take? What sort of salaries are we going to pay? And what sort of overheads? And how do we put together a bid um, in the real world? And we structured the assessment so that it was a learning exercise uh, for them. And, uh, and that simple model actually turned out to be quite interesting. And I think for, for, for people in this world, that idea that there's some rote learning to be done, there's some interactive stuff to be done, and there's a stretching assessment is really quite a nice framework. And, uh, and I was amazed that I didn't get an echo back of, well, this is what our pedagogy is. This is why we're going to change the world. This is how we can do it more efficiently or better or more reproducibly than the people who are trying to teach in other ways. And so... Uh, I'm really interested, you know, and if you can grab me before lunchtime or whenever I, I head off the, this afternoon, I'd love to know, you know, what is your model for teaching and learning? Uh, and to, to think about ways in which what's happening in the, in the simulation centers can sort of burst out from that environment into the wider world of teaching and learning. Because I think you guys are sitting on top of something which is incredibly uh, valuable and useful. And that's all I'm going to say about teaching and learning and pedagogy, okay? Again, you guys have had much more experience uh, than I have in this world. So we're going to talk about something else, which is what happens when you start to use mo uh, modeling or simulation or synthetic worlds in a way to try and discover something where nobody knows the answer, where it's new to everybody? What happens if you try and use it as a pioneering tool to work out what the future ought to look like? What sort of things would you do in that world? There isn't an eye in the sky this time. There's nobody up there saying or out there saying, no, 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 you've got to do it this way. Or actually, the answer is 
42 or whatever. There's nobody out there who knows that because this is a new venture um, that, that nobody else does. Nobody really knows how to run healthcare all around the world. It's phenomenally expensive. It's very highly, uh, it's full of all kinds of failures and there are all kinds of problems with access and uh, getting everybody through it. Uh, and yet it's something we all need and nobody knows how to do it properly. So if you're going to try and, and, and tackle that, you are moving into territory where nobody knows the answer. There are a lot of people who will tell you but they don't know the answer, because if they knew the answer, they would be incredibly rich, and they would have sorted out the problem in at least one country in the world, and nobody has done that. So, if you've got a way to represent reality, okay, and it's, it's, it's not my world, uh, my world would be to use computer models and uh, the differential equations and stuff like that, but in your world, you have got some tools that <clears throat> you say, this looks like uh, the, a real situation. And, and sometimes it looks very obviously. There are, some, there are some of your tools where it's almost impossible to know whether it's a simulation or not because the verisimilitude is so good. And there are other things where you know actually this is a model. I'm going to find it really hard to get emotionally uh, tangled up with this particular patient because it just looks like a piece of plastic. But that doesn't matter. Okay, You've got a way of representing the real world and you have access to how the real world responds in a way that other people don't have. So, why do we like simulation? Well, we like simulation because what happens in simulation stays in simulation. You make a crazy mistake and nobody knows. The computer, somebody in Google may be able to, to hack it and, and to put you out as a meme, but nobody else in the world knows that you've made a really stupid mistake. You make that mistake on the ward, you make that mistake um, in, the, in the cath lab, you make that mistake in the operating room, and everybody knows about it. Um, I was told, actually, that when you start in a new job, it's a good thing to make a mistake that everybody hears about. Because 20 years later, when they're looking to promote somebody, your name will still be around and nobody will remember why. And so you'll be able to just sort of step into that job. So, you know, you've got to watch out what sort of mistakes are you going to make. Uh, nobody dies in simulations. That's a big point about them. That's a big safety uh, factor uh, in favor of them. Uh, you can repeat them ad nauseum. You know, sometimes you have a problem in doing something. You know, I just can't get my head around this. Well, it doesn't matter because the simulation can. It can keep throwing you up examples over and over again until you feel confident that you can do that smoothly uh, and without the adrenaline uh, drowning everything else. It's reproducible. You can keep doing the same sort of simulations uh, over and over again. You can begin, and this is where the curiosity bit comes in, you can begin to ask questions like, what if? What if I were to do this in a particular way? What if I could do this procedure every time in between three and a half minutes and four minutes? What if it never took me less than three and a half minutes and it never took me more than four minutes? What would it mean to train a group of people that could always do something within that sort of narrow time constraint or within a narrow quality constraint? What, what if um, I could do that? Sometimes you want to run stuff faster. If every simulation just works at the speed of one minute per minute, then you have to spend your life watching things that go by at life speed. But sometimes you really want to slow stuff down and say, hang on a second, what was going on there? You know, you watch magic tricks on TV and that you slow them right down, don't you, to work out what it was that was really going on and suddenly you see the little flick where the card appears and then disappears and everybody was looking somewhere else. Sometimes you want to slow life down a little bit to work out what is it that I'm missing in this thing here. Sometimes you want to speed it up. You know, you, you're not interested in two days of recovery. You're interested in what happened at the very start, what the interventions are. You're interested in having a look at what came out of that, but, but the, the intervening bit, you don't have to watch in real time. You might watch it at two times or three times, or you might just zoom to the next bit that you want to do. The best simulations are as complicated as they need to be and no more complicated. One of the uh, tricks in simulation is to work out how much of reality should I put in there. People who can create absolutely all of reality, it doesn't really help you because you've still got to work out what is going on behind here. What are the key things that are happening? And if you can get the right level of simplicity on reality, you are in a good position. And again, it can be a lot cheaper. Um, it's certainly cheaper to train pilots 
in simulators than it is to burn all that fuel with empty planes while they're learning their skills. So there are huge uh, cost savings which are becoming um, uh, available and are more obvious to people. My guess is that the biggest cost savings are the failures that you cut out because failure is an incredibly expensive process. Uh, it just sort of knocks on from one thing to the other and, uh, and it's very hard to track the avalanche of effects that can come out of a failure. And it's not just in education. Education is actually quite a late comer to the world of uh, simulation. People are using it in design. Uh, people are using it for de uh, developing doctrine. The military have used it uh, for decades. Um, some really early stuff was done in the 1920s on, um, on, on what an aircraft carrier was going to do. If you remember aircraft in the 1920s, they were sort of kites with a bit of a lawnmower attached to them, not very sort of effective at all. And yet a group of people got together and they built a simulation with dice to work out what happens if you can put five airports at sea in one fleet and four airports at sea in another fleet. And let's game that and let's see what happens. And they worked out that you had to be able to fly these frail things for hundreds of miles and bring them back again and land them on a postage stamp. They realized that you had to stuff your aircraft carrier full of aircraft if you were going to be effective. So many of the sort of the cardinal points of uh, uh, naval uh, aviation were worked out by the people who first started to game around and to work out what would happen. Doctrinal development, education, a lot of engineering is based around prototypes. A prototype is not the final product, but it's something that helps you to make enough decisions about the final project, a product uh, to be meaningful. Uh, films use simulation increasingly. My kids sit there, they go, oh, CGI, and suddenly the film's not worth anything anymore, you know. And uh, so, you know, there, there's, there are things that are, that are going on the whole time where people are trying to make synthetic worlds. Um, Learning is, is an area people play games uh, to learn. People in research set up games. Uh, when I worked in a research center, we were having a problem with an optical switch, and we just made a simple game, and we just played each other with it until we worked out what the rules were for this uh, thing, and then we patented um, that set of rules. Logistics, manufacturing, all kinds of people are using uh, simulation, troubleshooting. People, if you're in an oil refinery, and, and something goes wrong, you will go back to the simulation before you try and dive into a pipe or start turning a, um, a, a stopcock to move things around. You will try and work out on a simulator what is wrong. So reality and simulations of it are incredibly linked. If they're linked at the right level with the right level of intuition, you can do lots and lots of things. And you've been using it for training. And what I'd like to persuade you to do is that it's a, a really useful set of skills that you have if you want to get into how healthcare should be integrated. If you want to make that step from education into integration, you've got to start to look at the tools that you've got and the skills that you've got that as incredibly valuable, not just for what you're doing at the moment, but to help people do something that they've not been able to do up until now. Obviously, uh, simulation and stuff like that, we're seeing more and more of that kind of stuff um, on computer screens. We're seeing it augmented um, into our fields of uh, vision. Uh, some people uh, think about augmented reality, uh, think about uh, simulations in terms of walk-through environments where you test stuff out. I remember uh, maybe tw uh, 20 years ago going to a, a place in Washington, the Hit Lab, I think it was, uh, it was called. And there the guy was just interested in all kinds of human interfaces. And uh, one of the things he told me that was really interesting, he said, if you're going through a virtual environment um, and a computer program, he said, if you go through it with a joystick, you won't remember it as well as if you go through it on a 2D treadmill. If you actually walk it on a 2D treadmill, you'll remember remember that environment better than if you go through it using a joystick. Um, lots and lots of people do paper-based um, simulations, and people make scale models. Architects are making scale models um, the whole time. So there's lots of ways in which we go through this. And we could use our form of artificial reality for all kinds of stuff. I'd like to persuade you that it's good for process development, for developing new services, for trying to work out, you know, if we were going to do, I don't know, um, 25, some ridiculous number of appendectomies in a morning session, you know, how would we do it? And, and then it becomes a bit like a pit stop in a Formula One race, you know. So what is it I have to be able to do when I'm actually there in front of things? Who needs to do what? How do I streamline this? How do I get the processes aligned so that I've got reproducibility and speed to give more people access um, to the care? Technology adoption. Um, I was talking to some people 
um, in a London trust, and uh, one of them gave me some comments on this, and they're starting to use simulation as a way of, of introducing new technologies. And so they're using it for their technology um, adoption stuff, for business planning, workforce redesign, lots of talk about workforce redesign. In the UK, it's been largely a failure because they invent a new kind of position, and then they just stuff that person in, and they don't get rid of anything around them. They don't reflow any of that person's, uh, any of the other people's workflows. And so there's no saving. You're just paying for an extra piece of work. Honing practice, getting better and better, and architectural design. And uh, I wrote that up um, uh, for um, Andy Smith's paper, I think he is, um, when, I, when I first went to um, IMSH last January. Uh, and he said, you know, well, why don't you write a, a couple of uh, thousand words about your, your vision there? And so there's a piece there. If you want it, I can certainly um, get that to you. But how are you going to make it happen? So let's step back a little bit. This year, and in fact, for each of these years, we're going to be thinking about 50 years of the sort of the Apollo space program. I'm sorry, but I was a child in the 60s. And for me, you know, I was one of those breathless little kids that was just watching and waiting. And I remember on one of the launches, they, they, they were showing the launch, and then they showed the, 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 the rocket going on up. And underneath, there was this word flashing that said simulation. And a cruel uncle of mine, he said, Terry, he said, do you know what that word means? And I said, no. And I was watching, and he said, it means it's not real. And my whole world came crashing down as I was watching this thing because it was a simulation of what was going on up in space. But nonetheless, a lot of what they did was really important. And um, I've, I've written a number of articles in the Accountable Care Journal trying to sort of put some of this message out about how you can use uh, simulation uh, in, in a different way. And uh, one of the things that, that's sort of intrigued me is this whole idea about digital twins and how if you've got a, a, a twin of the real system, you can often do um, exciting stuff. When I first saw um, Apollo 13, the, the Tom Hanks film, uh, with Ed Harris playing Gene Krantz, I thought, I really like that person as an example of a project manager. And I thought, I know what I'm going to do. My, uh, my final year um, group of students, we're going to sit down and we're going to watch Apollo 13 every year as part of the final year module. And we did. We, we, got, the, we, we, we got the film out and we, we, we filmed it. And we added a bit to the module, which was about recovering from failure. Every project gets into failure. That's not a sign of a bad project manager. Good project managers recover from failure, bad project managers do not recover from failure. And so we looked at Gene Krantz as one example. We looked at the London uh, Ambulance um, uh, system, uh, call-out system, as another example. But the, the, the interesting thing here is when I read Gene Krantz, I realized that they'd been using process games back in the early 60s. They all came out of a military background, and just like the military planners in the 20s had been using games to try and understand what an aircraft carrier would do, so these guys, their first uh, 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 instinct when they didn't know what they were doing, and they didn't know because nobody had been in space before. Um, they, they were beaten um, to, the, to the thing by a few months by their big competitors who weren't going to share that information, and they probably wouldn't have believed it had they done so. And so they have to work it all out for themselves. And the way they did it was to set up some simulation games. And they created two teams. They created a simulation team, and they created a flight team. So Gene Krantz, if you remember the film, if you don't, go home and watch it this Christmas. Um, he's the guy with the white waistcoat. His wife gives him a new waistcoat for every flight, and he puts it on. And um, he's, he's the guy who, who is in charge, and he would have been in charge of a flight team. And the simulation team works out a sequence of signals, and they're delivered to the flight team as though there was really a rocket on the launch pad all the way up to coming back. And so they would send them the first set of signals, and the flight team would react. And they'd keep developing it. And as long as the flight team kept up, they would keep getting the next set of statements. So it was a, it was a game, and they would play it until all of a sudden they would either run out of uh, ideas or the, the, the mission would crash or whatever. And when they got to that point, when they didn't know what to do next, the two teams would sit down together and they'd work out some more doctrine. They'd say, when this light flashes, we'll do this. When that flashes, we'll do that. When you get this combination of signals, this is what you've got to do. And that enabled them. And, and, and the, the, the Apollo system did not lose, the Apollo space shots did not lose a person in space for the whole of that time. They lost some people on the launch pad once in a test, but they didn't lose a person in space um, 
for the whole of that time. The next people that the US lost in space were on the shuttle, as far as I recall. So that was a phenomenal uh, safety record in very highly um, uh, difficult and uncertain circumstances. Um, and I'm sorry to keep going on at the films. I don't know whether you've watched um, the First Man film. How many people here have watched First Man? Oh, this is very sad. Okay, you have to watch it. The good news is it's, it's basically La La Land on the Moon. It's the same director, the same leading actor, and the same music, uh, the same uh, composer. Okay, so if you, if you enjoyed La La Land, um, and somebody must have because of the awards it got, um, then, then, then at least you can um, enjoy that. Um, it's, it's more psychological than Apollo 13, which is a really technological um, sort of uh, film. But one of the things that, that's, that's sort of all the way through those is the use of simulators. I don't know whether you remember in Apollo 13, they, have to, they, they shut down the whole of the, um, of the command module, and they have to then reboot it. But they've only got limited power supplies. And so there's a guy on the ground, and there's a story around him because he didn't get to go because they thought he was ill and he wasn't ill. But there's a guy on the ground played by, is it Gary Sinise? Gary Sinise? I don't know how you pronounce his name. I've only seen it at the bottom of CSI. Um, but, but Gary is, is, is there, and he has to keep working at this stuff. And every time he over-triggers the, um, the ammeter, he has to start again. And eventually, he plays with this digital twin on the ground, and he works out the sequence that they're going to have to use in space that will allow them to light up again and come home. You couldn't have done that without a digital twin. There's a picture in, the, um, in First Man where um, the person playing um, uh, uh, Neil Armstrong, he's, he's sort of flying this sort of bedstead type thing because that's the best simulation they could get of what it was like to land on the moon. And it sort of starts to tip up and he ejects and he nearly gets killed. He comes within fractions of a second of dying and he's back at his desk that afternoon as though nothing had happened. And that's, it's, that's why it's such a psychological sort of exploration because he was quite an unusual um, person. Um, but simulation played a huge role in that. What have you been looking at? Oh, you've been looking at that. Sorry, I'm one sink out here. I apologize. That's better pictures, isn't it? Um, uh, and um, as I say, that use of uh, that, that, um, that NASA uh, used of simulation, and that's the sort of thing that you can do with your, with your tools. It's highly iterative, but you should be able to say, actually, let's start to work out what this would happen. If we were offering this as a service, not just a training service, but as something that people would come into, where they had expectations of how long it would take, what would the outcomes would be, can we work on making those more uniform? Now, my interests are largely in computer-based model, modeling the processes. And, um, and again, there's, there's some stuff out there if you're interested. I think it's fascinating because I think you can connect your world to the world of computer stuff, and you could create a seamless synthesized world that would allow you to go out and to say to people who don't know how it's going to work, look, this is your best guess as to what the world is going to look like when you start to integrate things. Because integration is phenomenally difficult. Going to the moon was phenomenally difficult. And uh, the best shot that they had of minimizing their risks and working out what they needed to do was by simulating like crazy all of the time. So we've thought about using simulators in education, and we've connected the new to one and the one to one, taken a historical look at a time uh, when simulations were heavily used. Let's just try and think a little bit ahead about designing new services, and then we'll try and look at what design information you need. Very quickly then, sorry, um, let's pull this um, t t together reasonably quickly. Here is an engineering design cycle. It's called the spiral cycle. You can look this up on, um, on, on Wikipedia. There's lots of them uh, that are uh, there's agile. You'll have heard people talk of. I don't care which one you want to use. Find out which one works for you. Uh, this one I like because it's repetitive and it keeps coming back to uh, the same sorts of questions. It revisits the same questions. You know, what do I really want? Um, will this uh, do it? What's wrong with this design? And then how do I design the next cycle of, uh, of my design process? How do I work out what I'm going to do next? And prototypes are an important element to any kind of service design because as you change the solution, you change the problem. If you had an A&E department that could deal with everybody in one minute, okay, then people would drive from hundreds of miles to get to your A&E department. And suddenly, the whole shape of urgent care would change 
for 150 miles around because you had made one particular bit better and you would have changed the problem. And instead of trying to work out how to handle 500 people a day, you might have to try and work out how to handle 3,500 people a day or whatever. And so, ah, oh, that's interesting. Um, oh, there, it's back. Okay, I thought, uh, obviously it said something wrong, something that the um, reflector screen didn't agree with, so it was denying me access. Um, and, and, and prototypes are a way of trying to work that out. You build a prototype, you test it, you say, okay, now the problem's changed, how do I go into it again? And you re-prototype it. And you guys are the kings and queens of prototypes, because that's what your simulators are. You know how to prototype different types of services at one particular level. And so, they can be almost anything, and you guys have got particular control of one type of prototype that's really important. And what you've got to bear in mind is that you're trying to put a, a jigsaw together in which there are lots of different types of players. There are people that have got sort of clinical skills, and they've got clear ideas of what's needed. You've got people with, um, architect, uh, with, with architectural skills. You've got your business people who have to make it pay. The person who's running your center has to pay, has to make the whole thing pay. And um, I don't know what models of return on investment you've got. I suspect they're still pretty primitive. Um, and uh, basically, you stamp your feet and say, look, you won't be safe if you don't do it our way. And you've got to move on from that sooner or later to something which says, actually, here's your return on investment. Every, every pound, every euro, every dollar you put into us results in $10 worth of value for the bigger system. And as soon as you can start to do that, if it's $100 you know, of, of value to the bigger system, then you are on to a much stronger uh, way of doing things. So, uh, you've got all of these different people, they all see uh, life in a different way, and somehow you're going to try and integrate that together. So, what is it you need to provide answers for if you're going to be a process innovator? I put this little framework together, peaked. Um, I, was, I was asked to do some stuff, uh, a couple of days uh, of work up in uh, up in Manchester, actually, uh, uh, 15 years ago almost, um, and um, they were they were looking at services that would move out of the clinical lab and into the chemist shop, the pharmacy, if you like, um, on the high street, and they were looking at ways in which you might reconfigure care to do that. And uh, what, I went along to one of the days, and everybody was obsessed with data, data sets. They said, we need this data set, you know, we need this amount of data. And I thought, no, 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 data is the least important stuff. So I thought, well, can I come up with an acronym in which data is at the bottom? And so the D at this thing here is the very last thing you think about. And it's probably not the best way to design a, a, an acronym, but uh, it made the point that actually your data is the least important of what you're trying to do. What you want to do is to start with the processes. What are the processes that I'm trying to do? Um, how am I going to try and do it? What sort of protocols already exist, and how do I think I want to change um, those protocols? Um, sequences, what depends upon what? And that's not just what depends upon what having happened here where I am, but what is going to come in from outside at exactly the right time so that this process will work smoothly. What's, what... what um, uh, what radiology results do I need to know by what stage? Um, what um, uh, 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 clinical, result, uh, clinical lab results do I need by what stage? Um, what sort of knowledge do I need from other people at what stage? Getting the sequences and the information that empowers those sequences is one of the most important things you can do with a, with a process uh, map. So, if it's going to work well, what's the sequence? What is the empowering information? And so, from the first stage, you want a set of optimal sequences, you want some idea of queue management, you want your optimal staffing levels to come out, and as soon as you start to think about information, who needs to know what, um, and I, I've, I think this is, uh, this is a really interesting area. Everybody's going crazy about digital at the moment. People have been trying to um, make uh, hospitals much more, in, much more information rich. But until you start to ask some very simple questions, and you know, I'd love to talk to you afterwards about some simple models of information flows, who needs to know what for this to work well, when do they need to know it, 
and what information critically. Clinic, the clinical world is different from almost every other world running a shoe factory or, or whatever because a lot of what you need to know is in people's heads and a lot of time they haven't even thought about it in the way that you need to know that information. They're just intuitively on top of it and they sort of have an idea and you've got to try and elicit that in a way that's going to run your processes. You want to set up your quality after that. If I'm going to run this process with this information, what does that tell me about the configuration management uh, of, the, of the kit that I'm going to have? What's it going to tell me about the timeliness and quality of information and, the informa and, the, and what I need by way of outputs? And then out of that, you get a clear idea of each aspect of quality, uh, including the time limits and how long um, uh, things are going to take, okay? Now, these are not normally what you're interested in when you're training somebody. You just want to get them to competence. You just want to eliminate the errors. This is all about saying, actually, I want more than that. I want reproducibility at a very high level. It would be like training somebody to change a car tire and saying, I don't care whether it takes two and a half seconds or five minutes. Actually, if you're in Formula One, you do care. In fact, that matters to you more than almost anything else. Sure, they want to make sure it sticks on the car afterwards. And sure, there are people who have to pull out when the, car, when the wheel hasn't been put on properly. But if you've got somebody who can do something in half a second, that team is no good to you unless you can get three other teams that can also change a car tire in half a second. So this is about what you do with other people and how your time scales match to other people's. What technology am I going to need? And technology comes a long way down the line on this. You've got to know what you want to do, get your technology going, and then you want to start using your simulator to work out what are the KPIs going to be, um, what sort of uh, um, metrics am I going to use to run this, and how am I going to interpret stuff when it goes wrong. So, I think this community is sitting on a gold mine that could really transform healthcare in, in, a, in a, an unbelievable way if it realized what it was sitting on and if it had the determination to say, I'm going to do something about that. You can have the slides. I'm, I'm quite happy. If you, if you write to Mandy, um, she'll send you the slide set. Um, a key mindset change is to stop thinking about, I want to do this a bit better and to think, how do I really want it done? What is it that I really want to come out of it? I think you need to interface to communities that you're not talking to at the moment. Uh, and there's a whole world out there of people that you don't know yet whom you're going to be working with closely if you're going to change uh, the world. And probably you have to start thinking about what you want rather than just making life better. So thanks very, very much indeed for putting up with me. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Terry.